Global controls will have to be imposed. And, 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 and a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Welcome to Tinfoil Hat. We, 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 we go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. There's you just blew my mind. Yeah, and welcome to Tin Boil Hat. We are back. Are, am I good? My my sound keeps going out. There we go. Welcome to Tin Boil Hat. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, you know who I am. You know what I'm here to do. I told this guy that he basically blew my mind the last time he was on, and uh, we have to do we had to do a second episode, so we're doing it now. Please welcome the man who's reshaped how I see the universe. Uh, I'm very excited to have. We're going to do our follow-up to the Great Floods and the Sumerian Kings list. Please welcome my good friend, Matt LaCroix, everybody. How are you, Matt? Hey, Sam. It's awesome to be here again. Have, I really enjoyed our conversation last time, so I'm excited to continue where we left off. Matt, thank you for coming on. Uh, did you get any feedback from the listeners of this show? Did they, did they show you any love? Because I know I was uh, singing your praises to everybody. Yeah, people um, seem to really enjoy the last conversation. They wanted more, so I, you know, I thought, you know, Sam and I better get get back together to continue, you know, a lot of these these areas that we weren't able to fully cover that we need to expand on. For sure, man. So let's kind of go over real quick what we've already covered. That there was a um, there was a list of kings, these Sumerian kings, uh, who, according to evidence, lived. 20,000 years for some time reigned the world for 20,000 years. And there's this belief that they are the direct descendants of what we believe would be the Anunnaki. Uh, and they are and, and reason. I love this because it, it, it really clicked for me that this is what, where we get our Royals from. Like where did the, who picked the Royals? Why is somebody a Royal, a royalty? And you're like, Oh, maybe it's because these Anunnaki decided to make this special group of people who kind of were our herders. They, they kind of were meant there to hurt us to follow their rules. And it also explains to me why when we see like Hillary Clinton laughing about basically carpa bombing children in the middle East, uh, how she laughs at it. Cause maybe they see us like we're cattle, like the way we see, cows or whatever or cattle going into the slaughterhouse doesn't really move us so maybe these these lizard people or whatever we want to call them kind of look at us the same way am i correct on that in a, so far in a weird way they they absolutely um some of these elite families and secret societies do feel like they're um superior to some of the other population in society I mean, I'm sure you're well aware someone does just do a little search and look up the Georgia Guidestones. Not too far away, just down the road, right? Georgia. Yeah. And you can see all these commandments from these, you know, these secret societies that want things to be run a certain way and maybe have a population be a certain maximum amount and and have um, certain rules and laws be enacted that perhaps aren't quite there yet. But I'm sure you're aware of that, Sam. So take a look at take a look at that because it really shows you their true colors. And a lot of people have actually vandalized that site. You know, writing like there, yeah, there it is. They people have actually vandalized that site quite a bit because they've learned about it and they've actually taken trips to it. You know, spray painting things about you know, you know, down to the elites and yeah, you know, for sure, like dude. But it's definitely interesting, man. It lets you know when we take a look at like I've decided. And I've lost family members of cancer. I've lost good friends of cancer that the money given to cancer research. I think we've, we've had, we have a cure, but why is cancer still happening? Well, because these people who own everything keep putting this money, this cancer, this stuff that caused cancer into our food, into our water, into whatever we drink, whatever we're breathing. We got 5g coming out, giving people. And I'm thinking, wow, this could be very similar to the great flood. That, you know, when the Ray Flood cleaned everybody off and started anew, hit the reset button, this could be another way of doing that, where it's like, maybe this time they don't want to ruin everything. Maybe they want to just get rid of the people and keep the, everything else intact. What a great way of doing this through 5G, through all that. It's like, 
Hey, man, if you know, farmers don't want their cattle to unionize, to get <laughs> rules and do all that shit. You know, they want it to regulate. And I can see all that going on. It kind of fits into what you've been talking about. It starts to make a lot of sense when you look at the way that they're they're running things with wars and just, you know, not allowing um, l allowing big pharma to take over and not allow all these cures to come through because there's no money to be made in that. And it's it, it's clear it's a very dark area and it's something that should be known and we need to we we should mobilize as a society and you know force all this darkness out. But and it's gonna be it's gonna be baby steps because so many people, as you know, are indoctrinated into thinking that we live in this happy little illusion where you know white picket fences and and that the rest of the world is you know, in our debt because we're, we're their great saviors. When in reality, it's quite a bit of just propaganda mixed in with, you know, nationalism forced on people so that they think, oh, it doesn't really matter um, what I have based on maybe what at the expense of somewhere else, you know, when that person is sure. buying a diamond to put on, to put on their ring was, it, you know, did that come from some, some, you know, war torn country in Africa where they're, you know, using, you know, child laborers. We have, to, the point is we have to look at this entire thing from a perspective of um, what what goes into creating, you know, an empire that's successful. It, you know, what cost is it based on war? Is it, you know, what is it really based on? And that's where we're gonna, we're gonna get into as we, as we go deeper into some of these topics. The last but, point I want to bring up about next, about last episode, and it really opened my eyes, was Mesopotamia, is that I pronounce it correctly? Yeah, and where yeah. that is, is exactly where all the wars are going on. And it also is where like, quote unquote, there might've been a Stargate. So when George Bush says weapons of mass destruction, that's something he might be referring to. And it really does make sense. I, like when we see that Venezuela has so much oil and all these, and we're exporting more oil than we take in from Saudi Arabia. You're like, oh, maybe there's something else going on in that region. And maybe this is a very sacred land uh, that is maybe goes all the way back to Anunnaki and the Sumerians and all that shit. And it really starts to make more sense to me. Well, let's, let's link all this. Let's, start where we um where we left off last time and bring up some really interesting topics and there's going to be some people that undoubtedly get offended this episode because we're going to be talking about things like what's those, the truth behind the, the eagle symbol those are like my that. favorites those are my favorite episodes <laughs> <laughs> okay well, let's get started um so i want to temporarily begin a little bit ahead though because we had a very important holiday yesterday that i don't know if you went out to any bars, Sam, but we had uh, this this holiday, St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. And so Day. I wanted to start right out by just, you know, we can break the whole, break the ice and just break out the truth about what St. Patrick's Day really represents. And then we can backfill and then connect all the way to the Sumerian King list. All right, let's do it. Okay, so while a lot of people yesterday were getting probably very drunk and maybe <laughs> thinking, well, I'm having so much fun on Irish Pride Day. But wait a minute, it's not called Irish Pride Day, is it? No. It's called St. Patrick's Day. Right. So why is everyone thinking that this is a, a masked Irish Pride holiday where you know you're you're saying, well, you can't talk about St. Patrick's like that. It means you hate people in Ireland. No, it actually has nothing to do with that at all. And we're about to review how uh, especially places like the United States tend to take certain ancient holidays and turn them into something that they're really not based on, you know, keeping the people happy and for sure, dude, drinking and, and, you know, spending lots of money and Christmas all is a great example. It's like Christmas is about a mushroom. It's not even about Jesus. It's about a mushroom and doing mushrooms and tripping balls. And they've turned it into buying a bunch of shit. Cause some fat guy told you to. <laughs> yeah. It's like a materialistic holiday. Yeah. That's all it really is. It's not about love. It's about how much can you spend on someone. Right. Yeah. And that, and that's really shows you what kind of a society we become. And, and so let's, let's expose the truth about St. Patrick. And, and first of all, I want to just get it, get it out there. I have nothing against Irish people. Ireland's an amazing place. Irish people are incredible. Great boxers. But this is, this is one of those um, holidays that actually represents something very evil. 
I... and in and by the time we get to the end of this you may be quite disgusted with this holiday I, i'm sorry to ruin it for anybody but you know you can drink and have fun on any night hey dude um, i'm gonna i'm uh i'm sober so I, I don't need the drinking and if i can see less fat people in green stumbling and drinking all over drunk all over the place i'll be fine with that a lot of people don't actually know what saint patrick's day represents or even who saint patrick is so i want to lay it out there and of course I want people to always be their own independent objective researchers and be looking up things as I'm going because that's how you can verify and understand that someone's not pulling your leg or taking you on some direction that's misinformation and fake information, right? Right. So so please look into this, everyone. In the 17th century, there was a bishop known as St. Patrick, okay? And St. Patrick was the son of a Roman official. And that's very interesting as we get into Rome and its influence in the Roman Empire and, and turning into the Holy Roman Empire, because that's going to be a really, really important thing to understand here. So I want to just have you remember that. And so St. Patrick was tasked by the church, the Christian church, to go to Ireland and rid all the snakes from Ireland, right? And then the most common thing I hear when I say that to someone, and people go, ew, I hate snakes. And I, and I sort of, I laughed to myself, I, I, you know, cause I'm thinking, well, I guess they don't, they haven't really studied geography that much and understand that it's way too far North in the latitude that they never actually had snakes. They've never lived there. They can't live there. It's too cold. It's not their climate. So there's no snakes there. Right. right. And then people sort of shake their head and they're like, well, I just don't understand then. And then they, you know, and then they, they give up because a lot of these this information from the past that's been interwoven into religious stories and and, um, and holidays is based on these metaphors and these ancient symbols, okay? So when when St. Patrick was ridding all the snakes from, from Ireland, what he was actually doing was on a, uh, a quest to cleanse all the remaining pagans and druids from the region. Oh, okay? man, okay. Okay, so... They had names, and, and you'll recognize this, Sam, as we go. It'll start to really make sense. So they were called the snakes, and then basically meant uh, these non, um, non-monotheistic non religions that didn't that didn't worship the, the Christian Bible. So we're talking in ethnic cleansing right now. Yeah, and so St. Patrick went to Ireland, and it, I got to also point out it wasn't just Ireland. Um, this whole cleansing thing occurred all across Wales, Scotland, England. It was it was basically the United Kingdom area with Ireland. And what there was, which is what makes this so sad, and I'm gonna connect this all the way back to the beginning, was that the Druids and Pagans were the last group, I mean that, the last group on earth pretty much that it had that still practiced a lot of this ancient wisdom from the past that we're about to go over. And the Druids were the very same ones who built Stonehenge. Okay. Oh which, my God. So this is the beginning of like the Roman Catholic church trying to erase ancient history almost. It was actually the end. And, and we'll, and we'll go over that as we go because they were the last group at this point, the Ro the Holy Roman empire had already wiped out groups all over Europe and the middle East in, in their crusade to become this conquering Holy Ram Ro Roman empire. And that term is very important. Because, and I'm not going to jump ahead too much, but understand it's called, it went from the Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. And that says everything right there. And, and we'll backfill that as, as we go. So what that means, well, what is Stonehenge? Well, it's this ancient astronomical um, megalithic site that focuses on perfecting their understanding of the stars and the movements of the equinoxes. They, they were basically the remnants of the knowledge that came out of Egypt and Mesopotamia, okay? And the Egyptian knowledge became known as the Gnostic knowledge. And we're gonna go over some of those Gnostic writings connecting all the way back to Enoch and how that turned, in, turned into stories that were left out of the Bible intentionally. Yeah. So, so we're, when we look at this holiday, we're looking at the destruction of the last culture that was that were known as the snakes because they were practicing this forbidden wisdom, which we're gonna go over. And so the, the first place we get to start is understanding what these symbols mean, what they represent. 
and these metaphors that are hidden and confuse people because they don't really understand a lot of times. They, the term snakes, serpents, snakes, was a term that represented ancient wisdom, balance, and higher consciousness. Okay, and we're going to go even further back too because these symbols are like onions. They have many, many layers of understanding. They're not just one linear thing, okay? So that's on the surface what it, what it meant, but it goes further and it actually represents a, a complete hidden struggle that we're going to go over here in a second that I call the War of the Eagle and the Serpent, okay? Okay. But that's what's so important about St. Patrick's Day is it represents the, the end of this war where the last, the last remaining culture that had still had this knowledge and practiced these, this ancient wisdom was essentially wiped out. And, that, and after that point occurred, there was only this fragmented secret societies left that were being hunted down. So when we yeah. talked about in the back, uh, in the last episode, about how the um, Anunnaki created this group of um, this whatever, I don't know, I call them lizard people now just because I don't know whether they're reptilians or not or they have more reptilian brain in them. Whatever they are, they are a different group than us. Is that, Are the Jesuits any possibly part of this, descendants of this group? Think of it this way. Different root races and groups and bloodlines around the planet that then became um, focused around to be become superior. So, you know, one... One of these beings may, let's call him Yahweh, may find a lot of um, superiority in his opinion with this this Jesuit ancient Jewish connection. So he wants he wants that s- civilization to be superior. Meanwhile, another god might find another like an Assyrian bloodline may want that one superior. So then they they trick the people into fighting each other and killing each other so that they can sort of have this domination of a certain culture on the planet, a uh, certain, a certain race. So let's, let's connect this and get into it. And I'm now going to go right back to where we left off to okay. explain what you were just essentially talking about. So where do these symbols first get seen? And let's trace the origins of them to then understand how it became the rulers of empires throughout history. Okay. And, and what these symbols really mean. When we left off last time, we talked about the pre-Diluvian time period, before all these cataclysms, all these ancient Sumerian kings that ruled. And then we weren't able to really connect after that point. And like you said, Sam, it really became this reset. After these multiple uh, cataclysms occurred, it wiped out all these ancient civilizations that once existed, and then it all started over. And that's when this conflict began with okay, everything started over. Let's create the, and be the architects of the new world. And then that's where the conflict began, where they started competing. And I'm going to explain who they are. Oh, they man. started competing over, over which, you know, which civilization would be the greatest and then rule the world, essentially. Wow. Almost like, like they're a chosen people that they, that they want to become this superior race. Okay. And so, and I, and I, I want to just point out, I am, I am absolutely someone who tries to always be open and never is never racist. I find every, every group around the world to be amazing. And I try to never uh, angle this so that I'm trying to act like one group is better than another. I'm simply looking at this from a higher perspective. You're crunching the numbers, you're crunching the numbers, you're doing analytics. Right. Yeah, and exactly. You're just, and you're saying this. And so when when these cataclysms occurred last time, it, getting to where the Sumerian king was, where we left off, it states that the first king, the first architect of the new world, was going to be this king named Atanya. It's that one, right? Atanya was the first yeah. king of the post-Diluvian time period. He was the king that was chosen to rule and, and be the architect of the new world. And it actually states that. And I'm going to read a direct translate translation from this tablet and that's why I wanted you to pull it up so people can have a, a something they can they can look at and then understand so that it's not just someone reading something they've never seen before okay go um, on. he's sending it right now so hopefully he'll get it or okay yeah he'll get it but go on okay. so Atanya was as I said was the first king in this of the city of Kish after these disasters occurred and he was a, he was chosen to be the first king again part of these bloodlines. Right, right. And, and, and every one of these kings 
were the ones who then wrote these tablets and these stories about what occurred because they're the only ones that had the information. Everyone else just below their high priest didn't have any information. It was largely ruled through ignorance, especially after this time period. So the kings retained all this knowledge. That's why they're the ones who wrote these tablets. Right. Um, I'm going to read from Tablet 1 of The Legend of Atanya. So what that is, is this king of the, of the city of Kish, this post-Diluvian uh, dynasty that emerged out of Sumer after these cataclysms occurred. And he wrote this preface in his tablet that then connects to where we're going to go with the eagle and the serpent. Okay. And this is directly from the tablet. I encourage people to go look themselves. But this is, this is it, it starts out by saying in the preface, they planned a city. The gods laid its foundations. They planned the city of Kish. The Ajiji founded its brickwork. Let Atana, Atanya be their shepherd. Let Atanya be their architect. The great Anunnaki gods, ordainers of destiny, sat taking their counsel concerning the land. The creators of the four world regions, establishers of all physical form. Okay? And so that's how it starts. And if, you, and if you look at some of the words they used, they specifically stated that Atanya was chosen to be the architect of the new world. And he was then given all of these laws and these rules handed down, just like Hammurabi was in, when he became the ruler of Babylon. Okay, and we can talk about that later. Now, what, what's important about that is once you get past the preface, it then gets into discussing this very symbolic metaphorical story of a, of, of this what happened with a, a, a serpent and an eagle and it's one of the first representations we have cuneiform tablets that actually talks about it okay so the first thing i want to clarify is that these symbols go back to the very beginning and they're not simply what we think of as a linear perspective to look at things they go they go back to a, a complete mentality that ruled these gods okay yeah i love so, this <laughs> So yeah, it's it's like mind-blowing stuff when you actually look at how all of this information was present in these tablets and cylinder seals, and then you see flags and crests all over the world, yeah. and you can see how it mimics it. And, and we're gonna bring that up in a minute. XG can get that flag picture ready for later. We can show the extent of how these symbols have influenced human civilizations all throughout history, okay? To, and to be clear, there are other important symbols too like the bull and the owl, <clears throat> okay, and the lion. But but we're going to focus today just on the eagle and the serpent because they are, in my opinion, the two most important of all. Okay. And, and I want to start out by pointing out what the two symbols really mean, okay? Yeah. As I said, the serpent became a demonized symbol that we associate with evil and darkness, but it's actually the complete opposite. The serpent was a symbol that's always represented ancient knowledge, wisdom, and, and balance and reaching higher states of consciousness. Okay? We've seen this before with uh, the Antichrist. We've seen it basically with the demonization of Mother Earth, the divine feminine, how that's been yes. turned into some dark stuff. And the, like the Mother Earth, which is, if you think about the sun, God in heaven, what would be the opposite of a son in heaven would be a daughter on earth or a mother on earth. Mother Earth and how that got demonized over time. It did. It did because it's this feminine creative energy. And that's what we're going to start to go over. Oh, because these this. gods wanted to be the creators, not the natural process that connects you know this conscious intelligence of the universe they want it to be the gods and so this you you find this emergence of um especially christianity demonizing a lot of these of the most important terms of all and like you said sam it's very confusing because people quickly learn that most of the most important things became the opposite of what they really mean yes and that's what dude. we're about to go over yeah, that's it's called an inversion or even a perversion, too, because that means you not only invert something, but then you demonize it so that it's 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 essentially a dark version of itself right. that people think is evil. OK, and that's exactly what happened with these symbols. So I explained the serpent. Well, now what about the eagle? Well, you know, you're you're coming your your stage is in America. I'm across the other side of the country in America and we have flags on every doorstep with this you know big eagle flying back and forth and we're told that the eagle represents freedom and um 
you know, tr- freedom and truth and being this like a savior yeah. around the world, yeah. right? Yeah, for and, sure. And yet at the same time, we're this, this advanced, essentially like almost like an advanced Roman empire that then that governs the world and gets influence in all of its affairs and puts in proxy dictators yeah, that, yeah. To, just to follow its own rule. It's really interesting that the symbols just don't make sense, do they? Because yeah. because when we look at that, it's it's a opposite of what's supposed to mean. And that's exactly what happened. And that's going to be very difficult for a lot of people to accept. So what does the eagle really mean? What well, does eagle, it mean, dude? What does it mean? The eagle, the eagle has nothing to do with an actual eagle. Okay, eagles are beautiful and they're wonderful and has nothing this to is, do with the We don't want to eagle. piss off the eagle people, all right? Exactly. This is not Just anti-eagle like people. is really not that representation representative of the actual physical snake other than the fact that it sheds its skin frequently like a metamorphosis of someone's consciousness, yes. okay? But I, getting I, back to the eagle, what the eagle truly represents is is that which can see all it is the highest flying bird of all so it sees everything okay okay and it represents this over dominated masculine energy okay and and this uh this control through demiurges and even war it's actually quite a negative symbol because what it essentially represents is this struggle between our two sides either one through through that what the Gnostics call our demiurges, which is like the material obsession, greed, money, and control over that which is the opposite of something that would be spiritual and balanced. And it's that's what these two like sides it, represent. We kind of talked about this last time where it represents this kind of uh, things we're seeing on the all seeing eye, the spying, the the mass surveillance of this group higher above everybody, mass surveillancing everybody. So it symbolizes this, the highest view of all below almost. Yeah, it's and and now it gets even more wild than that because when you when you read these cuneiform tablets about who these gods were, you find out that there was this conflict that emerged. Okay, and I encourage people to check that out. It's, it's absolutely mind blowing. There was a there was a conflict that emerged essentially with these two brothers. Okay, and this, these two ancient brothers were given control over essentially Earth. That's that's what the ancient stories t- um, say. And this isn't just something that comes from something that comes from Zechariah Sitchin, this story of this, this, this divide that, that, that developed over human consciousness is shared by cultures all over the world from, you know, Peru and India, all the way to Egypt and Greece and Mesopotamia. It's all around the world. It's the same reoccurring story where it's talking about how, like getting back into the Adam and Eve story, it, it's talking about how there was this conflict that emerged where one side, think of that story, that, that biblical version, the serpent wanted to give Adam and Eve the knowledge of good and evil to give them higher consciousness. But this God figure, we can just throw an eagle on his on his lap. He wanted he wanted humanity to be to be ruled by ignorance, to not understand good and evil. But yet at the same time, even with that right in people's faces, they think that the serpent is evil. Even though, even though the description completely goes against the model, the model of what they're being told, because why would you want, why would there be a God figure that that is has humanity's best interests in mind that doesn't want them to have knowledge of good and evil? Okay, and that's exactly where this this is going to go. Those two figures are the, these these figures in the Sumerian gods um, list, essentially, they're known as Enki and Enlil. Okay. And they were these two brothers that are considered the dual ownerships of how things would go for our for our world. And I want people to take a step back, understand the vastness of the cosmos and, and how how small and, and puny just a little planet can be in, in the in the vastness of actually what exists out there. And and realize that it wouldn't be that big of a deal if you could if you imagined that there were beings that were advanced enough that they could literally like have planets be their 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 ownership just like if if you thought to yourself if a conquistador went across and took over a region and put its flag down it would then control the entire direction of where that those civilizations would go right right. it's it's really it's like having um it's like owning a you know some piece of land somewhere so that you want to decide how it gets run so these these mesopotamian tablets talk about how 
there was this this divide in this in a struggle that occurred and getting back to the the legend of Atanya Atanya states that there's this he he describe, describes how there was this ancient story how there was a serpent and an eagle who tried to work together in trust to better the future and the eagle betrayed the serpent and then cast it down so that it was forced to rule in the underworld okay while the eagle then was able to control in, in, in the upper the air and the higher in the higher dimensions yeah. that's really how we got to look at this okay. are these are these different roles that were then taken up with certain symbols that were then used to represent what what they their mentality was okay now so what did, was that? did did now does the eagle and the serpent represent actual people or just an ideology ideology that's and and that's the complication is a lot of people will say well this is just human archetypal natures you know one is the lower state of our greed and our materialistic side with war and the other side is our higher consciousness and that it's all just symbolic and there's nothing there's nothing further to it but that's like, like i said it's like an onion that's a layer that's a layer of understanding because if you go deeper, you then see that it, it's further than that. It represents the way that these two, essentially these two sides, these, this divide that occurred between these, these beings that wanted to rule our world and wanted civilizations to go. And so those civilizations then took on certain mentalities. That's why you can find eagle and certain eagle and serpent um, symbolism all over the world, everywhere. If you go back into cylinder seals from Mesopotamia, you can see the two the two symbols all the way back from the very beginning where it shows showed these two sides that had emerged. And it's not just two, two individuals. It's all of those, um, you could call them deities or gods that we, you know, have turned into that term, but essentially these beings that, fall on either side of this mentality you know so what was enki and all these ancient teachers well they were the ones who taught about like the serpent again this the, high, the, the knowledge of higher consciousness the wisdom from the past balance understanding what our role is within the cosmos versus this other side this this eagle side where they where they wanted to control human humanity through their demiurges and their lower states by controlling them through conditioning their reality with war so that they think that that's what their, their purpose is. And it's part of their natural state. Yeah. And, and we can, and you see that now you see that now where everybody like, well, but just America, that's how we, uh, that's what fuels our economy is war. You know, we've been, we're America. We've been in war every single day of our existence. Like, well, that's, that's not necessarily have to be, and it's not natural. I don't believe and we've been conditioned to believe that is natural. And it's I, been going on forever, Rome. Yeah. But since. it's like that's this group of like these dark arts motherfuckers who are obviously of the eagle when I'm all about the serpent, doc. Well, let's and, and let's get into it and let's connect all this back to where you know we started with St. Patrick's Day. So even as far back as looking at so, like something like Alexander the Great who conquered a lot of these regions, he's always shown and depicted with this eagle following him. OK, that's that's his the symbol showing that he was basically under the favor of that certain God. OK, it was like representing the different sides that ruled here. Wow. So symbolism ended up ended up being the telltale sign of who was controlling and, and, and deciding how those certain areas would go. OK, and like like I said, when the Druids were essentially cleansed and wiped out, it was the end of the serpent. There was all these cultures that had once existed around the world had been conquered. And we'll get into that, too, especially when you look at things like the flag of Mexico and a lot of the, a lot of these um, ancient cultures of the Americas yeah. and, what, and what occurred with them. So yeah, and then, now this might blow your mind. So this simple uh, the dog. serpent we're talking about. Oh, there you go. There we the go. symbol of the serpent that we're talking about. Remember, it's this this demonized term, right? Right. When we think of who this Satan figure is, and we think of these different roles that they took on. Remember when I was, and that's the flag of Mexico that we'll talk about. Yeah. It's can you leave it up, you, uh, Aaron? Can we it shows see you it again? The struggle right there. Wow. Yeah, dude. The eagle versus the serpent, dude. There it is. Oh my okay. God! And the eagle is winning. Yeah, and, and, and not only that, but the eagle is holding the serpent in place and controlling it. 
like it in and if it's if that was just a symbol that went back to cultures and it had and it wasn't connected by anything then why is it shared all around the world that is it's crazy, one of, it's the right? most common symbol that's shared by well, all of these cultures and and we'll, and we'll talk about that well the okay? the myth supposedly about um about it being found about the uh the the reason that the that that's on the mexico flag is technically because when um one of the indians was was sent to be told that when he found a snake on a cactus eating being eaten by an eagle technically that's where mexico started so when he saw that that's what gave him that thing no, where this that's is what mexico you're being told can yeah, you guys that's hear what me by the way exactly can you hear me sam, sam hit it right on the nose you're talking okay, about there we go. the story that was given after the catholic church conquered mexico okay? yeah dude for and, sure and, and we we're jumping a little bit ahead okay. until we get to that point. Pump the brakes, um, XG. Pump we're gonna the brakes. We're going to talk about that a lot when we talk about these conquerors of Mexico, okay? And I know I, I know I'm on 20 minutes, so i got to get going here. Yeah, dude, but get remember, deep, dog. Getting into it, Tanya, remember this symbolic story of how the, the eagle tricked the serpent yeah. into ruling in the underworld? You motherfucker. That's the story of Enlil and Enki. Yeah. And it's the, the two roles that they ended up getting. Remember, they were these dual rulers of our world. They now, were brothers, and one of them turned on each other. Is that it? Yeah, exactly. Not so cool. Enlil was the one that's always been associated with the eagle. Always. That's his symbol. And then all the sons and the, and the various influences and incarnations that have come after, they tend to follow the influences of their father or these mentalities. So it became literally a war over how the human race would end up, would turn out, essentially. And when you look at the last several zodiacal periods, meaning thousands of years of time between changes in the processional equinox and things like that, you find that these different time periods have been ruled by either war or like go, go way back to the golden age of these civilizations. They call it the golden age because it wasn't being ruled by war. It was being ruled by higher knowledge and technology. That's when those civilizations were destroyed after the reset, then you saw this control come in where all of these human cultures around the world were then coerced into becoming warring empires. And that's why they all have eagles on their flag, okay? But it gets getting back into what this means. So en Enki was uh, uh, tricked into becoming the role of ruling the underworld, okay? And what is the underworld? It's the Christian term for hell. That's essentially what it is, yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, and, and his term was Lord of the, the of the underworld or fresh water or Abzu, which was this this underworld aspect that we need to understand. It's about energy. OK, it's about understanding right. what this right. place is. You know, why do people keep incarnating over and over again? And then, you know, they they have some strange memories of some other other past lifetime. They're like, I don't understand. Is that deja vu? What was that? Well, what really is going on here with our incarnation? Are we stuck here? Are we here to? to have to learn and grow and, to, and and have to incarnate over and over and over again until we can become a certain kind of person. Well, where did that come from? Well, I can tell you exactly where it came from. If you read in the Atrahasis, these two, I said, again, this, this understanding is perhaps, and I point this out in my, as I'm ready, finishing the new book, it may be beyond our human comprehension to be able to understand, but these beings took on certain roles in our reality. Enki was forced, and those along with him, like Thoth, this high priest, were forced into ruling essentially the underworld and, and, and controlling hu human consciousness and incarnations. What is heaven? We just said what hell is. Heaven is just higher dimensions. So when they talk about in the Christian Bible, you say, well, I hope you ascend and go to heaven. You're talking about this ascension of energy to reach higher states or being recycled back through the underworld so that you have to relive this over and over again. Which goes okay. back to this Tibetan Book of the Dead, going and sending yeah. to another one, which is Matrix shit, which is That's like right. the Archons send you back into the light. They, they act like your grandma and you're like, oh, grandma. Grandma's like, oh, come with grandma to the light. <laughs> Boom, you're reborn again. And, and now- And this is what's gonna wow. totally blow your mind. If you have a situation where human consciousness and our energy can only ascend and leave this incarnation cycle if we reach a certain kind of state of energy in person, then it's brilliant then that those who are in charge of the physical world in higher dimensions, who are the gatekeepers of that, keep our, our realm in a state of conflict and chaos and war to prevent, prevent people 
from being able to get out of this soul incarnation system here. So it's they actually ah. are considered evil by a lot of groups because because some of these ancient groups believe that they're actually perpetuating human demiurges for a reason. But who's so doing that? Down low or up top? Enki, Enki is down low, but he's forced to only allow those to ascend that actually um, reach a certain state of energy. He's not in charge of what happens in the physical world. But so he is not causing the conflict and the warring and all that stuff. Somebody else he's, is. They're only de- he's only deciding who's who should be allowed to ascend based on rules that they've decided rather so than he has no he, he has no kind of control over what occurs in the physical world in the higher dimensions meaning if those who are in control of that keep us in a certain state of perpetual war we will never be able to ascend beyond a certain kind of energy when the age of pisces came which occurred after the flood those who are in charge of that age happen to be those that are in the, um, that I talk about Enlil and the and some of these figures we're about to go into. They, because they were in charge of that time period and they're in charge of our, essentially our physical world represented through the Eagle. They decided to just keep humanity in this. There we um, go. That's what I was this, talking in these, about. In these perpetual elite families that would that would force war war to occur. There we and go. If, people, if that's hard for people to stomach, I understand. But go look at a quote from <laughs> essentially um, Goodall Rothschild. She was the mother of all the Rothschild um, bankers. She says on her deathbed, "If my sons didn't want war." there would simply be none. Yeah. That's what she says. And she's talking about her sons who became some of the most powerful bankers on our planet and how they're part of these secret societies and bloodlines that control our entire world. Yes, They dude. control everything. Yes. There it is right there. Thank you. They don't specifically have the symbol of the eagle because they're they're connected to essentially the power of the Jesuits. That's why they have the symbol of like the lion, essentially. Okay, so there are other symbols involved in this, but the point is, some of these some of these beings who didn't who were really jealous and didn't want the human race to ascend and, and become greater than even then potentially, because they, we're just essentially these jump started. Uh, beings that have their their gifts of their of their intelligence and in a uh, higher consciousness and but the problem was Enki this this Satan figure that we talked about the serpent he's the one who created humanity that's what all the tablets say is that he took this Denisovian Neanderthal primitive being that was not more primitive being I should say that that was here and then they took their DNA and they jump-started us to become like these advanced beings. The but the problem was Enlil and a lot of these other groups that that, that created this divide, again, this war of the eagle and the serpent, they didn't want humanity to become have higher consciousness and to ascend. That's that Yahweh God figure in, in the Adam and Eve story. It's the same thing over and over again in all of these religions. They they essentially found it was a threatening thing that we never deserved those gifts that were given because the problem was we were created as more more or less like a primitive worker, but yes, the, slaves. On planet, but we were given many many more gifts than we were supposed to by this Enki figure, which is why he became demonized when a lot of these other rulers took over essentially r- religions and the way that our the bloodline families would run in in the book of enoch it talks about these watchers and it talks about how these beings are constantly watching our timeline in our world okay go look at that that's what it talks about they're the same the same thing that's mentioned as being like these fallen angels and those who are higher up watching it all connects back to how the human human race is essentially we're like an experiment in consciousness that's being observed and manipulated from in many ways to see where we end up okay dude so, that almost plays into simulation theory yeah now 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 let me, i want to get back to what i said before that connects the matrix because i know how much you like to talk about that remember in the matrix how people are being forced to to live in like this illusion while they're being used for energy yes right? and, and they're and, and they're not able to go anywhere and they have to keep continuing over and over again and then neo breaks out and realizes that the human species is like a slave for energy okay yeah that's exactly what is essentially happening here oh These my beings, god 
these beings, what they really came here for wasn't really gold. That's, that's just an under, that's a byproduct of understanding advanced technology and things like in alchemy. The real reason they came here was to take advantage of controlling essentially endless amounts of energy so that they could live forever. Okay. So when you have horrible fl false flag events occur here or all these e this evil that keeps perpetuating yeah. over and over again yeah they're essentially feeding off of the negative energy to, con yes, to keep dude. race control and dude okay? a big part of that they think is stevie weeby was talking about it it's like look at the moon man like some people think the moon is the energy connector and if you like a great examples like have you watched have you ever looked at pac-man Think about what he's talking bump, about, bump, right? Bump, bump, the Pac-Man looks like a moon, right? And it chases you down and it eats you. What happens to you? Your ghost goes to where? This regenerator in which you're reborn and you're spit back out. And they eat you yeah, again. And, 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 and again. get this. There's the, our moon is larger than any moon in relation to the size of our planet than any any other place that, that we know of. Oh, my in, God. It what all essentially connects. means, not to get down on a whole moon talk, but it, there's strong evidence that the moon was actually an artificial construct. It was put in place to create this soul incarnation trap. Yes! Okay, so that oh these beings God. could essentially live forever and feed off of our energy. That And that's why I try to explain how they took on certain roles where Enki became in charge of the underworld, whereas Enlil and the others became in charge of the, of, of the higher dimensions, which includes the physical world, so that they can control every aspect of the different realms of dimensions and energy that's here. Oh okay, God. because in the end of the day, Sam, this physical body that we see is just the vessel for this higher consciousness soul that we really have. And so what, what happens? Well, you just keep that soul trapped and perpetuated over and over again. And when we work all day and then we just come home and then we go to sleep, we're just giving up all of our creative energy and not using any of it. Where is it going? It's just going into this, this you know, feeding mechanism to keep humanity as being like these batteries, just like the Matrix talks about. Okay, is religion used to be called what was known as the old religion, and it was based on a guide or a manual for how you could reach a higher state of energy to get out of this soul trap. That's all it was. It was a way for like a manual for how to reach a high, your highest state. So what happened? Well, after this after these cataclysms occurred and those who became in control were you know became sort of corrupted controlled by their left brain this ancient reptilian brain that's why they're referred to as lizards in my opinion because it's their mentality they have no empathy they're simply just these controllers okay yes in competition so what happened is those who were in control of that time period got really smart and realized they could just take over religion and turn it into a control mechanism that instead of helping to ascend people, it trapped people instead. That's exactly what happened. Oh my so in 13, God. and this is mind blowing, the Roman empire, which was this great Eagle empire we haven't even talked about yet. Fuck you can Rome. follow these empires all throughout history, showing their flags and crests of which, which side that they were following. The Roman empire always shown by the Eagle, they used to have a, a, an eagle symbol, a gold eagle they would carry on in battlefields called the Aguila. It was so, they were so obsessed with this eagle symbol that if they lost it during a battle, they would send people as far as they needed to go on, on armies to, to regain it, sometimes losing enormous amounts of people just to get this eagle back. That's how obsessed they were with it, okay? So in, in the Roman Empire is collapsing, okay? Just like all these other empires around the world. And they had a brilliant idea. Constantine, who is the head of essentially the Roman Empire, he came up with this brilliant idea to reestablish the Roman Empire from Rome into Turkey. In 313 AD, he changed it. He created a city called Constantinople after his name. And this is where the Roman Empire in, in 330 AD became the Holy Roman Empire. And so right before this date, Christianity in what was known as the old, the old religion was essentially illegal and you were stoned or killed if you were a Christian. And then within a year or two, if you weren't a Christian, you were killed or stoned. So all of a sudden the Holy Roman Empire took on this Byzantine double-headed eagle, which was a symbol for an inerta, one of the one of the sons of Enlil. He's the same figure that plays Apollo to the Greeks, this war god. They essentially took religion, 
some, some of these groups, and they turned the, the Holy Roman Empire into this crusade to take over Christianity. And that's why the Bible keeps getting kept getting rewritten over and over again, and all these figures became demonized later on. That's how it started. No, no, what, what does that matter? Well, that the Holy Roman Empire are the ones who then hunted down all the remaining Gnostic and ancient Mesopotamian connections back to the serpent, and they were eradicating and killing them all. That's what St. Patrick was essentially doing. He was tasked with ridding whatever was remaining of these groups. Oh were my God, you know, it's so interesting, man. But then you think how there is an organized event in which people celebrate St. Patty's Day in which there was ethnic cleansing going on yes. and the destruction of knowledge. Unbelievable, dude. I yeah. am just... And and go and go look and like I said, these symbols. Go look at the serpent symbol. How remember we showed the flag in Mexico, how the eagle is holding it together and controlling it. That's that symbol goes far back further back, and it's not part of that Catholic story that was then created where Tenochtitlan was this capital that they saw an eagle on a cactus eating a serpent. Think about it, it makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense on no a physical sense, level. Dude. Hey, I got a question it's for you. No sense. I got a question yeah. for you. Uh, since what do you think? Who's who is Quetzalcoatl? You know who that was, right? Yeah, and, and I we have so much to cover here. Dude, we're, even I'm, hey, about we're doing a number Aztec. three. We're gonna do a number three. Yeah, because guess what? Because we have to go over Columbus. We have to go over. Pizarro. We're gonna do we a number go three, Columbus. dude. We're gonna do a number three. <laughs> okay, and I wanted to throw this out there so people don't think it's totally crazy. I want to leave on this. All right. When the founding fathers originally founded the United States, Benjamin Franklin wanted a turkey as a symbol, which is the opposite of an eagle. It's a ground. It's a bird on the ground that's about sharing and about balance. That's essentially what it was. And the original symbol, the first flag, was actually the Gatson flag, which had we said Look don't, at that don't, don't tread on me, which had the serpent on it. Okay. Yes. It yes. Yes, it was like changed to the eagle. Yes, dude. Yes. And, and what happened after it was changed to the eagle? The United States got corrupted and then turned into an an empire, a warring empire. Okay. Yes. And now, 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 getting back to XG's, like ne the next show, we got to talk about how all these ancient cultures, the Aztec and the Maya and the and the Inca, were all conquered. And essentially, by these e this, the Spain Spain who had the symbol of the eagle, who then corrupted them all and took them over. Oh yeah. my God, bro! Okay, and, and so we have a lot left to cover. I guess we're gonna have to do a part. Gonna have to throw up the three, dog. Throw up the threes, dude. Throw up the threes, dude. We're gonna have to have a number funny. three, dude. For sure, Matt. Matt Lacroix. Where can they find you? You just blew our mind. You just blew our mind. Where can they find you? Um, you can find me at my author website at thestageoftime.com and my YouTube page at Matthew LaCroix, uh, L-A-C-R-O-I-X. I really apologize for not covering some of the other stuff Matt, that you wanted to. Matt, stop. Again. It was great. I mean, Matt, <laughs> I could just sit here and not talk the whole time, just listen to you, or I can ask questions I think people want to go. It's going to take a little time. Dude, I'll throw a three up there. I'll throw a four up there. We can do a four. It's, it's endless. We're just going to keep going and have a good time. I love and, it. I love and, it. Uh, if you're ever in LA, we'll do something in studio. It'll be a lot of fun. You just blew my mind. You connected everything. Is We're going to connect what really happened with Columbus and what really happened with Cortez and Pizarro and how this, the eagle conquered all of the, all these serpent cultures and then took them over. Okay? We can go over all that stuff serpent after. Serpent for life. Matt LaCroix, you're a good man doing the All I see the is a work. shirt. All I see is a shirt. Serpent for life. Surfing I can life, already see dude. that. Love your fellow man. Love your fellow people. Fuck groups. Find knowledge. Ascend. Like, go to the next level. Dude, love people. Love everybody. Love your fellow man. <laughs> love, love you, Matt LaCroix. And we'll do it again yeah. soon, homeboy. Take care. Thanks, Sam. I really appreciate it. I'll catch you again soon. That was great, dude. Bye, everybody. We love you. Take the knowledge. Ascend.